Great, thank you. Okay. So we're going to kind of move to the other side of the intertrochanteric region compared to the kind of femoral neck side. So just generally regions of the proximal femur, femoral neck, peritrochanteric or peritrochanteric, and then subtroch. And here's kind of what we're going to talk about are these fractures that kind of start here but sometimes have these extensions and just a little more complex than the average intertrochanteric fracture uh, that you might see that looks like this. So first of all, intramedullary nails for proximal femur fractures are often a good thing. They're, they're centrally placed so that they're mechanically favorable to load share. The skin incisions and the muscle dissection is generally less than with a plating procedure. They have good track records and sometimes can be quicker, although those are often with less optimal reductions and things. But there are problems with nails. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to expand a little bit on the top one here. So, you know, I, I've, I've just kind of observed that geriatric hip fractures are extremely common in a lot of places, mine included. The knee jerk for us now is hip fracture nail. And so we kind of have extrapolated that to other fractures. And I would just say that putting a big hole in somebody's abductor insertion is a problem. And it has functional consequences in the geriatric fragility fracture patient that probably doesn't drive their outcome because there are other issues. But I think transferring that thought process to a young patient, you know, I, I see like 17-year-old patients who have hip fracture nails put in for their intertrochanteric fractures, and I just think it's, it's not a great decision for that young patient's abductors. When we treat proximal femur fractures with nails, we often have malreduction because the nail doesn't control the fracture as much as other forms of fixation particularly problematic with short proximal segments, basy cervical fracture lines, greater trochanteric extension, and reverse oblique patterns. Here are some examples of nails gone awry in, um, in complex proximal fractures. So the one on the left is this reversal obliquity pattern that usually it's, it's the issue is that it was never reduced to begin with. Here's another one you see complex pattern, poor reduction, poor implant placement, no interlock, problematic, and that's, that's a pretty big setup to do poorly. So we have an option of this blade plate. So the blade plate is not only a very stout implant, but it's also really, really the ultimate indirect reduction tool. And so we need to take a lot of care where we put the chisel and the blade, but you know, it gets talked about, it's fallen out of favor because it's very technically difficult. It's really actually not with good fluoroscopy and a good plan of where the blade is going to go. Once the blade goes in up top, then everything else, the dominoes are set up. And if it's done correctly, you can't malreduce the fracture once you bring the plate to the diaphysis. So just a couple thoughts in general on these, you know, and this is also back to the theme of kind of the knee jerk for geriatric intertrochs where, again, at my place too, it's fracture table and traction and some internal rotation. But intertroch fractures in young patients from high energy mechanisms are different entities and they reduce very differently. So you can't expect to just pull and rotate a little or whatever with a fracture table and have these fractures reduce adequately. They just behave differently. So I, for this reason, I don't put these patients in, on a fracture table. I have them free legged and I plan for an open reduction. Here's just an example of that. Radiography is critical too, and we want to study these really in detail. So we want to think about fracture lines, deformity, and then femoral neck extension, subtroke extension, and greater troke. These are all the things that are going to drive our decision to use a plate versus a nail, and also our operative tactic when we are going to, to, uh, to, to do the reduction. Now sometimes we really can't see well enough on the x-rays. Usually it's a rotational issue, but whatever it is, if we don't understand the fracture, this one on the right you see just, we really don't know what's going on. We can get a CT, CT scan. Here's another patient, common to greater trochanter. How proximal does it go into the neck? So this CT scan can really help us figure out where we're gonna put our clamps and, and our implants. So long subtrochanteric extensions I think are a very good opportunity <clears throat> for a clamp and a lag screw, and you can turn a pretty complex fracture. This would be a hard fracture to treat anyway, certainly with a nail, but we decided to do it with a plate, so you see with a, we use some pointed clamps, lag screws in the subtroke extension, and then we've got a pretty, uh oh, did I shake the mouse? There we go. And then we reduce the neck component, wire it, 
and we get a nice stout implant that can be loaded early. Whenever the blade plate is also the best opportunity to compress a fracture, and I would say there's nowhere else in the body that responds better and where it's more necessary to compress the fracture. So this articulated tensioning device should be remembered. It's an older device, but it's still in your set, and it's pretty easy to put on, and you can compress a fracture, you can weight bear patients right away, and the bone heals quickly. So here's a case of mine. So this actually, interestingly, is a 56-year-old cyclist <laughs> by me. And so this guy came in about a year ago. It was actually Christmas Eve last year. And so he's got this complex pattern. So he's young and active. He's got the basy cervical. He's got the comminuted trochanter. And he's got the subtroch extension. He's got flexion deformity that you see on the lateral view. So this is hard to treat. And I would say if you put this on a fracture table and put a nail in, you're going to be disappointed because it's hard to get these reductions just with indirect methods and traction. So we start with just an elevator to reduce the flexion. Now you see on the right, we've got that subtro component clamped and lagged. And now we're back to the neck component with a clamp. We start getting some wires in. We've got a joystick from A to P to further get that flexion out. And then we plan our blade. We need to get some wires out as the chisel goes in, but we end up with a nice straight and stable construct. And, and you know, I would say that for this pattern, there aren't a lot of good options uh, uh, for this. Certainly, we know that nails and basic cervical necks really don't match that well. Uh, thank you very much.